Hi everyone and welcome to our virtual First Friday Art Talk, the first one of 2021. Um, my name is Hisela and I'm a librarian at the Salinas Public Library and I'll be hosting today's Art Talk. We'd like to give a very special thank you to the two artists who are presenting today, Lisa Barker and Lynn Steigerman. So thank you, you guys. Each artist will have half an hour, which includes their presentation about their artwork and time for questions from us. We'd like to hold off on questions until the end of each artist's presentation. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first artist this afternoon is Lisa Barker. So Lisa lives in Greenfield with her husband, Caboose, and seven cats. She is an amateur photographer that loves to take black and white photos of her cats using her phone. Some of her work has placed in the Salinas Valley Fair. So I'm very excited to welcome Lisa. Well, thank you. I'm just gonna pop over to my screen. Well, this is my cat, Cal, and he's starting off our, our show today. I call it Cat Photo Creations because I take my pictures with my phone and I use filters on Instagram to make black and white. I'm really attracted to the crispness of it and the challenge of with some of my cats of trying to pull out the white and um, match it with the tones of their other colors there. I do live in Greenfield. I've been here since 2000. Uh, raised my kids here. We had five. Um, I'm an amateur photographer, as I was saying, and I started um, with my hobby on Instagram in 2016. So it's been a couple years. And uh, some of my pictures I'll show at the end, I, I did place um, in the Salinas Valley Fair, and I was excited about that. That was in 2019, and um, I would have done it last year, but there was COVID, and this year it's up in the air. Don't know what what's going to go on with the with the virus. I've had cats in my life for about 48 years, ever since I was um, four years old. I haven't listed all my cats' names up there because I had tons and tons of kitties growing up because we didn't fix any of the kitties when they were little, but now I do all the time with the ones that we rescue. Can everybody see the Meet the Gang? Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is Miss Tubby. She's 16 years old. She was um, dropped on our porch when she was just born with her mama cat and, and other siblings. Um, I, in this picture, I, I was pleased with the balance of the, the grays and the blacks and the whites that came out. It's, and, and a clear background. I usually have all kinds of garbage in the background. And it was nice to finally catch her with a nice clean background. She's a little darker here, but sometimes I like, I like that because it's, it's moodier. And I caught her in a, all night long while I laid on the sofa on my back and I nursed her with her little bottle every two hours and she's 16 years old today. She survived. She has the nicest, roundest, inquisitive eyes that we have of our kitties. Um, it's interesting trying to get a lighter shot of her because she has the blacks and the browns in her fur. So when I, when I use a filter, it's a balance between going too light or too dark. This one is darker, but I liked it because of the way it showed off the lightness of her face. This is Mr. Whiskers. He's 13 years old. I use a, um, a filter on Instagram called Willow for him. It's kind of a sepia and to me, he still looks orange, but other people say he's gray, <laughs> gray looking in the picture. He has the cutest little smiles that I like to catch. They all have great expressions when they're not sleeping because they're all seniors. There he is sleeping. And I like the way the background came out and offset the colors in his fur and where I can see the texture. And there's a lighter version of him begging for dinner. This is Appa. He's 11 years old. He was, um, he was born on top of a fence, fell down. Mama cat took off because she was feral and very scared and was very young. And so I took him home. He was attached to the placenta still. So we had to take care of that. And he, he was nursed around the clock and now he's 11 years old and ate a string one time. And we had to spend $15,000 to get the string out. <laughs> so these kitties are an investment for us. Looking a little bit regal. He's got that one smudge. He's a tuxie. He's gray. 
when sleeping, his favorite thing to do. When they, when they curl up with their feet near their head, we usually call them prawns. This is Cal, he's a younger one. He's um, six now. He was found in our backyard when he was about a year old. He had stepped on a nail and we thought, oh no, it's gonna get infected. He'll be sick, he'll die. So he got rescued. <laughs> They just keep coming and coming. He usually looks like this, like, what did I forget? So I like to capture his expressions if I can. And he's very curious. Good. Well, this is his sister, Bear Bear. We adopted her the month before we adopted Cal because my husband was so protective of her because she became a little lady because all the gentlemen were interested in her and my husband saved her from mama hood and then she was adopted by us. So she's a challenge. See how dark her eyes are? It's always a challenge balancing the white fur and getting the detail of that with her. She has very um, startling blue eyes and I can never capture that just right. Here I did a little. And I was using a darker filter on this one to, to show the contrast. Um, but I noticed the ones that have white or are more white than any other color are the most difficult for me at this time to photograph because I'll just get this wall of white in my picture instead of any um, detail. Well, the cat influence has been with me, as I said, since I was four. Um, they give me a lot of biofeedback. Not, and, and that's what makes it great to take pictures of them because um, they're constantly, whether I'm photographing them or just hanging out on the sofa with them, if I'm feeling down, they'll come up and rub up on me. If I'm feeling anxious, they'll sit close and let me pet them and the, the action calms me. If I'm upset about something, like the Postal Service did something, the, uh, Appa will come and put his paws on my chest and stare into my eyes and I know okay, bring it down a little bit. And if I'm too happy, like too much coffee, they'll come on my chest and purr. And uh, purrs are actually something I've been learning about that actually heal humans. They um, balance their heart rate and lower their, um, what do you call it, blood pressure. They give you the loving head bumps and they've got humorous expressions, which always crack me up. And this is Cal when he was listening to one song that we played. I can't remember what that song was. But all these expressions in here, you can see were various uh, intonations of the song. And he just made the worst faces. <laughs> I couldn't resist um, taking shots of him. And you can see that these are more, I have um, pictures like this on my Instagram where I'll have a nice portrait and then I'll have a lot with just quick shots where I have the background distracting in the background, but I wanted to show an expression that they did. And for now, that's as fast as I am on my camera because they get pretty fast when they're awake. This is Loki. She's the one with the inquisitive eyes, but um, for some reason, the way she's marked, it looks like she's always giving the stink eye. So I did a little collage of her. This is a kitty that we had a while ago. He's Tubby and Loki's brother. Um, he, that upper left hand corner is his uh, sly look. He could get anything he wanted with that look. And then the bottom right corner is his pretty please may I have dinner and yes, he got whatever he wanted with that look too. And this is Appa. He will not look at the camera period unless I take him into another room and then he's a big ham and I can even do selfies with him, which gives his face a nice funny distorted look. But he will avoid looking at the camera no matter what when I try to take his picture in the main room. Uh, an inspiration for me is John Cherry, somebody I went to college with. And watching him take black and white pictures on film um, with the camera that does all the fancy things that I don't know about yet. Um, and watching develop them in the chemicals and stuff was fascinating to me. And I think that's where I fell in love with uh, black and white photos over color. Um, so I had uh, my first phone and I took numerous pictures that are all blurry uh, on it. And then I um, tried Instagram and my phone upgraded because as they do, 
uh, and I found out I could get more crisp pictures. Plus, I was developing a, a knack for trying to catch the cats where they had a, a, a more blank or sedate background instead of uh, one shots every which way. I, I take a million pictures and then I'll get maybe four that I like and that work for me. And I try different filters on Instagram. Um, I, the more photos I put out, the more followers. I have about 3,300 followers right now which is not as much as people have been on as long as I have since 2016, but I'm more into sharing with cats, uh, cat lovers and um, other photographers and artists and cartoonists and just kind of creating a little atmosphere there around um, different ways people express themselves for fun. So one thing I discovered recently is this great site where if you take a picture like this, you can remove the background. And a lot of times it does a pretty good job. You can see all the hair and the whiskers and um, it gives you that nice clear background. It doesn't look like it, it's cropped so that everything is smooth and obviously cut off. Uh, so you can add different backgrounds at this website. It's great to do for people or Bitmojis if you're a teacher and you're using Bitmojis in your class as I do. Or you can go for a solid background. And this is Mia. She already had a dark background and you can see by the top of her head where it looks like they, you, you can tell she's been cropped out of, um, the back has been cropped out. But if you go for something jazzy, you can kind of hide that if you want to flash up your photo or you can just give it a solid background and that seemed to contrast really nicely with her light colored fur and all the swirls. Occasionally, Cal will pose for me. And so I, I have a chance to get a shot if I only had like the stool wasn't worn up, worn off like he's done with it. But um, they'll pose and I'm like, hey, that looks like a real photography pose. <laughs> this one, I caught him. He was actually under the blankets with his head on my pillow and he just looked at me and I was at the right place at the right time and I was able to um, catch him. I like the different shading. I like the way the white draws your eye to the center of the page and the folds of the blanket. It just, it popped for me and I really like that one. This one I want to enter into a contest. This is Bear Bear. This is her white fur challenging me again. You can see toward her elbow there where it just becomes a white wall and you can't really see the fur texture, but I'm working on it. This is Whiskers by a dirty window with a kind of a sepia tone. I used the willow filter on Instagram. Um, I happened to catch his little face perfectly in, in that expression and I'm real pleased with that. There's our kiddo bonkers. He's, he's, this is my first camera that I use and you can see where it's overexposed and it's, um, you can see on his chin how it gets a little blurry. I, I was learning how to target my picture and center on the right things and I'm still doing that but I'm getting better. These are the ones I entered into the fair. This one I got for breathing, the participation one. I did not crop background out of this. What happened was he had a light background, probably the wall and the ceiling, and I overexposed it so that I could catch his color and then I could just more out the background so it had a contrast to it. This one was honorable mention. He's a little dark there. I like that I caught the hairs on his nose and the texture there. Still working on it. This one surprised me. I got third place for this one. She's got those wide eyes again and she was just staring at that camera and she didn't flinch and they didn't look away or look over their shoulder. That's what I like. And up again. This one, I did not cut out the background. I didn't even know about removing backgrounds at the time. I just overexposed it when I was putting the filter on and it showed off his gray fur really nicely with the different colors and contrast there. And, and it really was, I like how it's striking against the background. And if you want to see more of my pictures, some of them are nice, like the ones I entered in the fair. Some of them are just very homey if you like cats or if you like photography or if you have an art site uh, uh, 
page on Instagram. I'm happy to follow everybody. You can see I have a larger following than people who follow me. <laughs> but that's because I, I can't say no. I'm just so excited and curious about all the different artists there are out there. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lisa. That was such a great overview of all your cats, their backstories and personalities. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed learning a little bit about each one of them. I'm going to open up the floor for questions now. So if anybody has a question, feel free to either write it in the chat um, or you can unmute yourselves and ask directly. In the meanwhile though, Lisa, I'm curious. With cats and pets, I'm assuming they like move around a lot. Um, so do you have any like methods or strategies of managing your pets to try to get like a photo that you might have in mind or is it mostly all candid or like how does that work they're usually candid because these guys have minds of their own and will not cooperate <laughs> <laughs> but i have seen i've been watching other photographers how they will set up with um, a nice solid uh sheet or blanket in the background and then let the cats do what they will and put treats out there i usually have it's just like when you're taking a picture of a baby, there's somebody standing behind you shaking the treats or the toy and getting them to look. And um, sometimes I can do it one hand, you know, waving something up here and click the, the, fo the phone. Um, a lot of times, like the ones that were portraits that I did, they just happened to be there posing. And... I ran and grabbed my camera and, and like I say, I, I take a lot of shots from the same thing and then find one that works. But uh, I, I write too, so I find it's just like writing. You, you write a lot of stuff and then you find something that works and the rest goes in a drawer. Thank you. Um, I never considered the similarities that cat photography would have to babies, but it makes sense. <laughs> I do have a question. Oh, yes, go ahead, Helma. And uh, that is, do you take your pictures in color and then turn them into black and white? Or do you have a camera that takes only black and white pictures? I have a, a phone that I use and I usually take the pictures in color. And then because I like to post them on Instagram, they have filters that you can use. And uh, I favor the ones that are black and white. And then they have the ability so that you can adjust um, the contrast or the brightness. Right, and, right. And, and I, that's where I get my winners from. But there are some apps that you can get that will take the picture in black and white and you can adjust for it. I just, um, that's above my uh, level right now, but I'm interested in that. But I know mm. they're out there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, one more question. So I remember you mentioned that you were fascinated with John Cherry's black and white film photography. Do you have mm -hmm. any plans in the future of venturing into film photography yourself or using any other type of equipment? I did get a camera so that I can work on the adjusting. It's an old one. But it's, it's, and it was a cheap one. It's an eBay find. <laughs> but it's a great way to start and um, begin to get familiar with aperture and things like that, that I don't know, really know what they mean. <laughs> but that's what I want to advance to. And I'm, I'm even looking forward to the COVID virus being nice to us so that I could take a class at MPC or Hartnell and, and um, dabble in that and grow as an artist. That's great to hear. Does anybody else have any questions? Great work. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, let's move on. Before I introduce the next artist, I'd like to talk a little bit about an upcoming program we have. It's our genealogy basic series. The first workshop in our series, Getting Started, is perfect for those interested in family history and who want to give genealogy a try. This introduction covers the basics to help you explore with confidence. You'll find out what resources people use the most, how to gather info from friends and family, making the most of the internet and more. So you can register online and I'll make sure to include the registration link, date and time of the workshop in the chat box. I'll also stick around at the end of the event in case anyone has any questions about this workshop or any of our other upcoming library programs. Um, so now I'm happy to introduce our second artist, Lynn Swaggerman. 
So Lynn enjoys using both photography and art to capture the beauty and history of the greater Monterey area, including seascapes, landscapes, places of interest and beauty, like the Carmel Mission. She loves painting transparent watercolors and works both plain air and from her own photographs. Based in Monterey, Lynn exhibits locally at shows and special events and has won various awards. So I'm so very excited to welcome Lynn and learn more about her story. All right. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this share screen thing going. <laughs> All right, so I was just going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how I came to get involved with watercolor. And I want to say, first off, I am an amateur. I am not a professional artist. I uh, really did not um, even begin to paint as an adult until I was at retirement age or <laughs> one of my retirements at any rate. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to say that because I want to encourage you, you know, if you've got a passion for something, you know, like Lisa has a passion for photographing cats or you, you might have a passion for painting in oils or pottery or whatever. So often people talk themselves out of it saying, I couldn't do that, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I know what somebody once mentioned to me was, if you can write your name, you can draw. <laughs> and, and it's just simply a matter of learning and practice and persistence and discipline, but you can learn to do whatever you have a passion for. And, uh, you know, as was mentioned, my passion is primarily the just incredible beauty of this local area. And so I will go out and now even in COVID season right now, I've been going out and doing some plain air painting, but uh, when it's not COVID season, I take classes at uh, either PG adult school or Monterey recreation. Um, you know, they are inexpensive and it provides the discipline of just sitting there for two, three hours and painting without thinking about doing the dishes or anything else. So um, I, I got started in watercolor very accidentally uh, when I finally uh, retired the first time, uh, which by the way, um, I was in high tech in, in software, I had a software company for a number of years. So, you know, that was a 60 plus hour a week job, so there was no painting. But once I had a little time, I wanted to take an art class and the only art class that was available at the time I could take it was watercolor. And I was disappointed. <laughs> but as it turned out, I just fell in love with watercolor and haven't looked back. And yeah, that's another aspect of passion. You know, people will be passionate about what medium they work in. And or they'll be passionate about what subject matter they work in. You know, like Lisa works with cats. I work with landscapes. <laughs> Other people work with still lives and it's, it's all good. So I, I just want to encourage you, as I said before, to pursue your own creativity in whatever way you, you want. I do believe it's important though, to have a discipline, you know, to, to make sure that you're doing it because that's what develops your skill set. So I brought a, a couple of um, pictures with. I, I don't have the extensive presentation that Lisa so beautifully did. <laughs> so forgive me for that, but I'll just walk you through a few paintings. And you know, if you're interested, I do have a website that you can look at more paintings and, and, and some photographs as well. And I think as was mentioned, I work exclusively either from my own photographs or plain air. I don't use other people's artwork. So this particular one, if you recognize it, is, uh, you know, Point Lobos and uh, China, China Basin and Point Lobos. And, and this was done from a pho photograph. Point Lobos is too busy to, for me to do plain air work. Um, so that's, that's one example. This too was done from a photograph uh, and this was, I'm trying to think now, I think this was um, Pebble Beach area. And I was just intrigued by the, the shape, the, the design of, of this particular tree. Uh, so I, I, I tend to be fascinated with color 
and with shapes um, and, you know, representational, but somewhat, um, you know, looser painting than pure photographic uh, representation. This was done plein air. This is uh, Monterey. It's the uh, El Estero, uh, downtown uh, Monterey. And uh, the, the water there is the strangest colors <laughs> at different times of the, the day. I mean, it, it looks weird to see this bright green water, but that was pretty much what it was. <laughs> so, so that was the uh, one that was done there. I also, in addition to, you know, just basic scenery, I do love architecture and there's so much wonderful architecture in the, in this area. So this was done plein air uh, at the mission. <laughs> I have a number of different paintings of, of the mission because that is just such a fascinating place to, to paint if, if you have the time. Um, and by the way, I'm happy to go back to any of these paintings if you have specific questions about a particular painting, because this is going to be a very short presentation, I'm afraid. Um, this, this was another one. This was uh, Pebble Beach again, and I was just, again, fascinated by the shape of, of this particular tree. Um, this is um, Garapata. Do you know where that is? That's down towards Big Sur. Uh, just wonderful place. I've done a lot of paintings there, although this one was done from a photograph. I have work plein air there as well. Um, this was plein air. This is uh, Pacific Grove. Uh, just sitting off the rec trail a little bit and, and looking in <laughs> looking in that direction. That, that was very intelligent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, and, and the sky was fascinating to me in, in this particular. It was one of those days that was threatening to get stormy. Um, you might recognize these from Cannery Row. This is the uh, Chinese workers' cabins that are just off the wreck trail in, in Monterey. Um, this painting I actually sold to... Um, a new senior housing development in Monterey, in downtown Monterey. So they acquired a whole bunch of art to, you know, spruce the place up and that hangs there. Um, this is Pacific Grove again, just a stormy day again, done plain air. Uh, this is Monterey uh, Del Monte uh, Beach. Uh, on a very stormy day. <laughs> uh, that was done from a photo. It was too stormy to do plain air on that particular day. Um, this was actually uh, further down the coast. This was um, at uh, the parking lot actually for the Hearst Castle. <laughs> and uh, it, the, the, just the vivid greens in, in the, the spring just caught my attention. So I, painted that. Um, then just to show I don't always paint <laughs> landscapes, this is my little yellow bird that the, um, uh, if any of you are aware of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at Cal State Monterey, they use this in their spring catalog. It was funny because of all the paintings I've done, I was like, what? You want the bird? <laughs> It's not what I usually focus on. <laughs> and then one other, just to show I do other things. This was done from a photograph taken at uh, the Pacific House in, in Monterey. They have a little koi pond there. There's a little koi swimming in the lower right-hand corner that you can just see. So um, my work... I. You know, like Lisa, I exhibit, I've won several awards at the Monterey Fair. I have not exhibited in Salinas other than, uh, actually, I think I still have a painting because COVID shut everything down <laughs> at the um, uh, Steinbeck Center and uh, do uh, open studio. Um, I sell work through uh, a store in uh, 
Pacific Grove, 620 on the Avenue is the name of the store, and was in a, a studio there, but the studio closed. Um, and, you know, just look for exhibits to, you know, exhibit my work in. And uh, it's just very satisfying to be recognized with awards from time to time. So, um, you know, about me, I grew up in New York and uh, the only art I did as a child was I was selected to paint on a store window for a Halloween <laughs> exhibit. Other than that, I, I really didn't do much art because it just wasn't something that was encouraged, quite frankly. Um, you know, studied English, but wound up in high tech. <laughs> so had an eclectic career. So that's really what I have to say. And I know that was very short. So if you have any questions about any of the paintings or whatnot, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I loved looking at various works from your collection and learning more about what drew your eye to each and compelled you to capture them. Uh, so we, I noticed that Dorothy mentioned that she loved the vantage point you painted um, the bridge in downtown Monterey. Um, she also asks, when you paint plain air, do you use an easel or an art journal or watercolor pad? Well, a little bit of each. I use an easel um, and I sometimes stand and I sometimes sit, <laughs> depending on a whole bunch of factors. I, I tend to use a watercolor block for plain air painting so that I'm not having to tape things down. You know, a block is just, it's like a pad where the pages are glued and you just peel them off when you've done a painting. Um, and so that's how I, I work. Uh, I'm curious, what is one of the biggest challenges of painting in plain air? Cool. <laughs> Let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges, but also opportunities is choosing what exactly you are going to paint because you're looking at a vast array of opportunities and you have to decide what to leave in, what to leave out, you know, kind of thing. That's, that's one big challenge. Another is uh, lighting and weather conditions change very rapidly. So you, you sort of have to fix in your mind what it is you're trying to, to paint. And even if the shadows change or, you know, the lighting changes. Here. One more question, if I may. Sure. Um, do you do drawings before you paint? I do rough drawings. Yeah, I, I try not to get too detailed, but you know, I do sketch in the major shapes. And then beyond that, use paint for, for drawing. Do you, you mentioned that one of the biggest challenges is figuring out what to draw and what to leave out. Um, do you scout the places you paint beforehand to try to figure out like what angles to paint from? Or are you like compelled when you see a great spot and you just want to paint it then and there? Yeah, we primarily just uh, pick spots that are uh, interesting, have enough, you know, visual interest and uh, preferably a little bit off the beaten path, um, you know, because we, we do it on the weekends and try to avoid having people stand over our shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, any one of the, uh, the, there's a group of three or four of us that do this pretty regularly. And we will, each of us pick different things to paint and, you know, come up with four, three or four very, very different paintings. So, no, I don't scout it out in advance, but I scout it out when I'm there, you know, to make a decision. The most interesting thing to me is, the detail and the precision in your in your paintings because my novice experience with watercolors it's kind of drippy and all over the place and <laughs> but yours are so detailed and spot on and I could recognize the places before you said where they were that was it was great watercolor is is it people a lot of people think it's the most difficult medium because it's unforgiving I mean once paints down I mean you can't like with oil paint, you can go over it <laughs> and wipe things out. 
You can't really do that in watercolor. But on the other hand, its fluidity and its transparency is what makes it special. So, you know, sometimes you, you have happy accidents, you know, something happens and you just work with it and it winds up being, you know, a value add to the painting as opposed to a problem. Look back at one of your paintings. Can you see uh, those happy accidents? I can. <laughs> <laughs> you know where they are. <laughs> uh, Dorothy had a question in the chat. She asked, do you teach either in, in person or online? I don't teach, no. Uh, but, you know, to that point, uh, I highly recommend, and I do this myself, to Google, you know, uh, free watercolor video lessons, you know, or, or things like that. There is a treasure trove out there on the internet of both free and, and paid workshops. But, uh, you know, anything from five minutes to a couple of hours worth of, you know, instruction. So if you're at all interested, I mean, take advantage of that. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention is I belong to, in fact, I'm on the board of the Central Coast Art Association, and they have monthly demos of all sorts. So if you, if you just go online to their website, you know, just Google Central Coast Art Association, and they're free, you know. So, I mean, we obviously encourage membership, but you can go and, and watch these different demos, and, and we post them after the fact so people can watch them as well. Um, and they're really, really top-notch artists. So that that's a very worthwhile thing to look into. That's super cool. I just posted on the chat the link to the Central Coast Art Association for anyone who's interested in exploring their website to check out these monthly um, demos. But Dorothy mentioned when you commented about there being a plethora of resources online, uh, she said, oh, definitely, I've learned so much by doing that. Oh, yeah. And, and you, you, especially, I think, with art, you're constantly learning. I mean, you, ne you never get there. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions for Lynn? Um, Angelica mentioned, thank you for the presentations. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so if nobody else has any other questions, um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, once again, a special thank you to both of our artists for speaking at today's event. If you'd like to further explore their work, um, I've included links to their social medias, websites, and emails in the chat. If you enjoyed today's event, we'd love to have you back at our next First Friday Art Talk. We're coming back on March 5th, uh, same time, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. So just make sure to check out our Facebook and website for more details to come. Um, I'll include a link to our Facebook and website page as well for anyone who's interested in following us. But thank you once again and have a good weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you, you for pulling this together. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>